There we go. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to He's a Solution Ministries. Glad to have you all here with us this morning. Open up, open up your Bibles to John chapter 16, uh, and we're studying verses 1 through 16 this morning. And the title of our sermon is The Work of the Holy Spirit. Now, our text opens up, as I mentioned, as Jesus and his disciples are, they have left the upper room. Uh, the upper room discourse, which we were reading in verses 14 and 15. Now we are heading up to the Garden of Gethsemane. So uh, from the from Jerusalem down uh, across the Kidron Valley and then back up uh, on the east side of the city of Jerusalem, heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, where we know that it's only a matter of time before Judas shows up with the Roman soldiers and takes Jesus away for uh, the beginning of his crucifixion. So uh, this is the conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, knowing that it's literally hours from the moment that he's going to be taken by the Roman soldiers. So in these last moments with his disciples, Jesus warns them about three things. The first thing he warns them about is about further persecution. He says, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. Now, being put out of the synagogue in Jewish culture is the equivalent of being disowned, not just by your family, but being disowned by your community. The synagogue was the Grange Hall of its day. It is where everybody went. This is where the weddings occurred. This is where the funerals occurred. This is where the, the weekly gatherings and get-togethers, the socials occurred. This is where the potlucks occurred. And if you get put out of the synagogue, you might as well just move to some non-Jewish culture because the Jewish culture is going to shun you. You're done. You're out. You're off the reservation. That's essentially the seriousness of what he's telling them. He says, you will experience further persecution. The next thing he's going to do in, the, in this text, he's going to tell them where, when, and why he is going. And then the third thing he's going to do is he will assure them that they will not be left alone, but rather that the Spirit will come. Jesus knows what lays ahead, and he does not, he does not want his disciples' faith to be shaken or destroyed because he wants us to know that we are not alone. We have the Holy to comfort, teach, um, to, to teach us truth, and to help us. Now, this is as much a, a discourse for the disciples, as Jesus is instructing them, as it is for you and me, okay? When he says they will put you out of the synagogue, I'm sorry, if in 2024 you suddenly decide that you want to live boldly for Christ, and you have up to this point enjoyed uh, attendance in the good old boys club or the ladies club where we go out and, you know, it's just party, party, party. And suddenly you're saying, you know what? Uh, I can't go this Sunday. I'm going to church. I'm sorry. I can't go this Saturday night. Uh, we've got a function at uh, somebody's home. We have a small group Bible study. We're doing a baptism. And they're going to start going, wait a minute. What's what's happening right now? Why are, why are you distancing yourself from us? I'm not distancing myself from you. I'm increasing my, my proximity to Jesus Christ. I'm getting closer to him. Nothing, nothing offensive to you. It's not going to be very long before you're out of the club. So you need to be aware of that. I do not believe that it's possibly bold for Jesus and popular in the world. I just don't think it can be done. And if you are popular with the world, it's probably because you're not being bold for Jesus. I, you gotta, you gotta choose again, hot or cold. Can't be lukewarm. Can't be well. You know, I get along with everybody. I, I'm on the side of, I'm on top of the fence where I can get along with Christians and I can get along with non non Christians. Well, could it be that you get along with non-Christians because you've never shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them? You've never asked them where are they at as it relates to their relationship with Jesus Christ? You've never thought to think or, or to ask, hey, do you have any idea when you die where you're going to go? Do you believe in heaven or hell? 
All right, these are all questions that as Christians, we should be asking friends and family members that we know are not walking with the Lord. Because the time to ask them is now, not to go to their funeral and ponder and wonder, gee, I wonder if they were saved or not. No, you need to know. And I always, I always think of it in these terms. If that person's family were to ask me to give that person's eulogy at their funeral, could I in good conscience say they're in heaven? I mean, think about that. Because I have been to funerals of the saved and I have been to funerals of the unsaved. And it is a very, very, very different experience. The funeral of the saved is joyful. Certainly we miss the departed, but we know that they're in a better place. We know that they're up in heaven with Jesus, seeing friends and family from years ago, reuniting with loved ones, their spouse in many respects. That's a celebration. Certainly we miss them, but it's only a short time. We'll see them again, as opposed to the funeral of the deceased, the unsaved, those who stepped into eternity without answering the question, what will I do with Jesus? What am I going to do with this person called Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God, who claims to be my Messiah, who claims to have died on the cross to forgive all of my sins? What do I do with that? Well, you either accept it or you reject it. Again, there's, there's no limping into this. You either are saved or you're not saved. And you can't be partially saved. You're either saved or you're not. Well, Lee, how do I know if I'm saved or not? Well, let's look at your life, because the Bible says that we will know them by their fruit. So if God has made you to be an apple tree, are you producing any apples? If God produced you to be a, a grapevine, are you producing any grapes? If God produced you to be a witnessing, sharing of the gospel Christian, are you producing any converts? Well, that's the role of the pastor. No, that's actually not correct. It's our job. Anyone who calls in the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has been equipped to go out and make disciples, to share the gospel, to share the good news with anyone and everyone. So we don't get to we don't get to sit on the bench. Well, I'm on the team, but I'm on the bench. Nobody ever puts me on the field because they know I'm not a good speaker. Or I'm not a good this. Nobody told you to be a good speaker. They simply told you to love, love other people and share Christ with others through that. So God needs us to be bold. But the reason he's giving us this exhortation this morning is he's saying, look, in your boldness, you are not going to be well liked. You are not going to be sitting at the head of the table in non-Christian circles. Uh, you are going to be I, unliked is 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 the best word I can come up with. Now the disciples are going to suffer persecution. Not only they're going to get kicked out of the synagogue, kicked out of their family, but they are going to be persecuted. And all but John are going to be martyred. So Jesus is trying to manage their expectations, and he's saying, "Look, <laughs> what lies ahead is my crucifixion, and I'm going to leave you, but I won't leave you for long. I'll be back." But understand, in my absence, I'm going to bring you another comforter. So although the disciples were not grasping what Jesus was saying, they're going, what's, what's happening right now? He knew that due to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they would eventually understand. Thus, he could continue to teach his disciples with confidence. Not confidence in them, but confidence in the Spirit who is soon to come. We understand what God is telling us through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have, we have to be in the Word. Now, it's okay to read the Bible, and a lot of a lot of Christians, especially baby Christians, you know, they've recently gotten saved, and they will say something like, like, you know what, I read the Word, and I just don't understand what I'm reading. I don't understand the context of it. I don't understand what's happening. That's okay. One of the reasons that we pray before we go into our Bible study, and we say, Lord, uh, we invite you into this study, Lord, speak to us, teach us, exhort us is because we want the Holy Spirit to be teaching us as we read and telling us, hey, this is what this means. Here's how we apply that. Here's, here's what you do with this information. 
but it's just like anything else. I mean, your profession, whatever it is you do for a living, um, go back to the first time you did that thing. You probably weren't fantastic at it. So it's just a matter of, of just doing it, repeating the process, being in the word on a frequent basis, and things will start to come together for you. Alas, all this, verse one, I have told you that you will not go astray. I don't want you to be kicked off. Uh, I don't want you to be pushed off of your direction when, when these things happen. But he says that they will put you out of the synagogues. Now, Jesus warned his disciples of coming opposition because he did not want them to be surprised and stumbled by it. He also did not expect that his disciples would immediately leave the synagogue or leave them by their own choice. They would be forced out of the synagogues for Jesus' sake. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, I understand that you were raised in Jewish households. I understand that you grew up following Jewish customs and laws and celebrations like Hanukkah and uh, all of these other things. He says, so it would be natural for you to go back to the place that you're comfortable in, and that is the synagogue, right? It makes sense. Uh, I remember uh, when I got kicked out of my home, uh, rightfully so, kicked out of my parents' house because I was not living righteously for Christ. I was living, um, um, I was living for Lee and only Lee, and so I was kicked out of my home. Uh, and I was welcomed in other churches, but those other churches didn't know what I was up to, because if they did, they wouldn't have welcomed me into their churches. But that's the point Jesus is saying. We have a tendency to go back to the place that we know. And if the place that you know says, uh-uh, sorry, you can't come here, we're going to have to go find a new group. And that's what he's he's conveying to them here. In the second half of verse 2, he says this, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Now, this time actually came very quickly. Uh, as we read in the Bible about Saul of Tarsus, uh, Saul of Tarsus was a very well-read, this is the Apostle Paul, but before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, and he was a mean and vicious Jew. Uh, he was convinced that annihilating Christians was doing God's work because Christians were essentially preaching blasphemy because they were preaching Jesus as Messiah. And to this day, the Jewish sect does not believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And so for you to say that to a Jewish person that Jesus is the Messiah, that's blasphemy. And Saul of Tarsus took it upon himself to say, that's blasphemy, and I'm going to kill you for it. And he was very successful in going around killing Christians, and he was convinced he was doing God's work. Uh, we see many people, especially in Muslim countries, you know, these, these, these unabombers where they strap bombs all over themselves and go into these areas and ignite them. Of course, they die, and many people around them die, and they think they're doing God's work. So that's what Jesus is warning of here. They're going to think that they're doing good things. Verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. And I did not tell you at first because I was with you. See, when Jesus was calling the disciples, which would have been three years ago, he did not say, hey, follow me. Hey, James and John, drop your nets and follow me. Oh, by the way, you know, three years from now, I'm going to go on trial. I'm going to be crucified. Um, now, I will die for the sins of the world, and I will rise again, and I will send the Holy Spirit. But right now, I need you to drop everything and follow me. <laughs> if Jesus would have told them that, do you think they would have dropped everything to follow him? I don't know. But Jesus did not give them the rest of the story because he didn't need them to know the rest of the story. He needed to know the next day, the next week. You know, and I will tell you that walking with the Lord and serving him is often that type of an experience where we want to know, okay, God, what's the plan? All right, Lord, I feel your call. I feel you calling me to go do this thing. But what then? What happens next? Then what? Then what? And God's saying, no, 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 
I've I've told you what you need to know. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I had a young couple in my office because they were looking for prayer and financial support because God is calling them to Saudi Arabia. Now, they are currently missionaries with YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission, and they're currently stationed in Honolulu <laughs> at the YWAM base there. And I'm laughing because God is calling them from Honolulu, Hawaii, to Saudi Arabia, Middle East. That's a very, very different experience, I'm sure. And I said, wow, God's calling you to Saudi Arabia. I said, what are you going to do when you get there? They said, well, we're not honestly sure. Uh, our goal is to establish a YWAM base, Youth with a Mission base. But they said in Saudi Arabia, you cannot preach Christ. You cannot be openly uh, sharing Jesus with anybody. So our plan is we're going to go over there and we're going to set up uh, workout facilities. They're both in uh, heavy into health and wellness and fitness. They said, so we're going to go set up gyms in the urban areas of Saudi Arabia uh, and through that, we're going to have a male gym and a female gym. Uh, and then through that, we'll establish a relationship and pray that God gives us opportunities to share the gospel with them in, in, in now that circle of trust. And I was like, you know, I, in my mind, I'm going through all the details. Well, how, how, what about an apartment? What about a car? How do you commute when you get there? What about this? Where are you going to live? And God bless them. They're like, we're trusting the Lord for that. We think this is what's going to happen, but who knows? We don't know what the Lord's going to do. Well, what about this? We don't know. We don't know what the Lord's going to do. And as young as they were and are, they're very wise because they feel God calling them to Saudi Arabia. They're going. And that's about the extent of the knowledge or understanding that they've got. Here's where we're going. Here's what God has called us to do. The details, a little foggy. We're not even sure how we're going to get there financially, but where God guides, God provides. God's will, God's bill. Wouldn't it be great if we all lived and walked our relationship with Jesus Christ in a similar fashion where we simply said, God, I'm available. Send me wherever you would have me to go. And Lord, I don't need to know the details. I just need to know tomorrow. What do you need me to do tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow is here, Lord. What do you need me to do tomorrow? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? You know, the old adage, if you want to see God laugh, make plans. Just be in the word, be, be in his will, and just be looking for what it is he would have you to do and where it is he would have you to go. Verse 5. Jesus says, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you who asks me, None of you asks me, where are you going? Although the disciples had asked Jesus about his death, they had never wondered about its meaning. They were mostly concerned for themselves. If Jesus went away, what would become of them? Now, keep in mind, remember, they, they left their profession. They literally dropped everything to follow Jesus. And they've been doing that for the last three years. And in doing so, they have seen miracle after miracle after miracle, people being raised from the dead, limbs being regrown, um, the sick being made well, multitudes being fed from five loaves and two fish, thousands of people eating, walking on the water. They've seen all these incredible things. And now he's leaving? Well, Lord, what about us? <laughs> And in the disciples' defense, I honestly believe I would be thinking the same thing. Where are you going? What do you mean you're leaving? No, 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 no. Time out, time out. <laughs> I left everything for this. And remember, you were going to establish your kingdom. You were going to you were going to rule and reign. And and because I left everything to follow you, I'm going to have a place at the table. And now you're Jesus soothed their pain with a wonderful truth. He said the Lord's physical presence would be replaced by something far superior. Whereas Jesus in the flesh could be in only one place at a time, the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once. 
limited access to the presence of God would give way to continual communion with him. Teaching through physical means would begin to take place directly within the heart. Far from being abandoned, the disciples would experience the presence of God like never before. Now, for us Christians today in 2024, we've never experienced a walk with the Lord as a believer in the absence of the Holy Spirit. Because when we invite Jesus into our heart and we make him our Lord and Savior, we immediately download the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and now dwells within us. And it is now through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are being led, we are being taught, we are being um, uh, we are being tapped when there's something going on in our life that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, the Holy Spirit is is leading and guiding all of these things. But the Holy Spirit was not on or in any of them when Jesus was on earth. So Jesus was limited to his physical form. He could only be in certain places at certain times, which means, as he was teaching the eleven. Every other church, every other synagogue, every other situation where Jesus wasn't, there was no presence of any created deity. God was not there through the power of the Holy Spirit. But by Jesus going back to heaven, he says, I will send to you a helper, and this helper can be everywhere at once. Verse 6, because I've said these things, you are filled with grief. Before Jesus left, the disciples were confused. They were thick-headed. They were afraid. They were selfish. They were self-centered. But after Jesus leaves and he sends the helper, as we read on, especially in the book of Acts, the disciples go from being these thick-headed, confused, afraid, selfish, self-centered people to being bold, to being wise, to living surrendered lives, to being incredibly generous to giving of their time. All of the things that we should see from the person who accepts Jesus Christ and makes him their Lord and Savior, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them and lives within them. We should see a significant transformation in that person's life. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know that there's anything more intoxicating than being around a new Christian somebody who just accepted Christ they are they are so excited man you can't stop them i remember uh oh it's been 23 years ago now uh when jacqueline got saved uh we had been dating for about 6 months and we'd started going to church together and one sunday night at a bible study she accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it was like instant change, instantaneous change. Joy, peace, long-suffering, mercy, grace. And all she wanted to do was talk about the Lord and be in the Lord's presence and serve at the church. And I mean, she was on fire and it was contagious. How come people who've been walking with the Lord for a decade or two or three or four don't have that same level of enthusiasm. Because I can tell you this, the power of the Holy Spirit has not changed from the time you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior to your present reality. So why aren't we as enthusiastic about our relationship with the Lord and our our, our walk with him and his desire to use us and our ability to be used? Why is that not as exciting five years later, 10 years later? Is it perhaps that we've gotten stuck in the, the mundane, the, the monotony of just being a Christian here on earth? We're just kind of biding our time, waiting, you know, oh, dear Lord Jesus, please come take me off of this planet. It's so obnoxious and crazy and silly, and this election is driving me nuts. Lord, just come now. Let's, let's, Lord, let's do this rapture thing. Let's get me out of here. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with looking forward to the rapture. I myself am looking forward to the rapture. Uh, that would be fantastic. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm out of here. And let's 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 move on into eternity. I'm looking forward to the thousand-year reign. I'm looking forward to eternity in heaven. I'm looking forward to the whole thing. 
But if God were to come now, if Jesus were to return and rapture the church today, who in your immediate life, family, friends, associates, co-workers, who would be left? So we can either you know, be pleading, oh, Lord Jesus, please come, please come. Or we could be, Lord, wait. My mother-in-law's not saved. Her husband's not saved. I've got brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws that aren't saved. I got people at the office that aren't saved. Lord, can you give me like, I don't know however long it takes. Can you give me a few more months so I can get the gospel to these folks? Do you see do you see the difference in thought? Again, I'm with you. I, I'm ready for the rapture. I'm ready to go. But who's left behind if we do go? So each day is a new opportunity to share Christ with those people because if you're not dead and the rapture hasn't occurred, God still has a plan and a purpose for you and he still needs you to be available, to be ready, to be equipped. You know, to be equipped, I was watching a, a documentary the other day, and it said that the average cost of equipping a U.S. soldier to go, go into battle is $17,500. I want you to think about that. From their, their Kevlar vests, to their weapons, to their helmets, to their gloves, to their boots, uh, to whatever else they have on their person— $17,500 per troop, per person in, in the military is the cost to equip them so that they're ready for battle. Now, we are tasked and told, God says, be ready. I'm equipping you. I'm preparing you. Well, he's equipping us with what? He's equipping us with an understanding of the word of God. He's saying, look, you need to know what's in this book. As a Christian soldier who's going to go out and share the gospel with people, you have to be equipped. And the way that we get you equipped is you got to know what's in this book. And you got to be able to communicate it in a way. And, and, and let me just say this. You don't need to communicate it in a, in a perfect way, in a compelling way, in an interesting way. You just need to share it. Because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. See, it's not the Holy Spirit's job to share the gospel. It's our job. But the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us as we're sharing the gospel, uh, just like the day of Pentecost, when Peter is preaching to the multitudes, and what he's saying is being heard by every dialect, every language that's there, and they're all hearing it in their language. All we need to do is just open up our mouth and watch what God does with that, but we've got to be equipped. We've got to know what's in here. So God wants us to be equipped, just like we equip the, the military for battle, he wants to equip us to be prepared in season, out of season. We never know when these opportunities are going to present themselves. Unless Jesus did what he came to do, there would be no gospel. If he did not die, he could not remove our sins. He could not rise again and defeat death. If he did not go back to the Father, the Holy Spirit would not come. Christ's presence on earth was limited to one place at a time. His leaving meant he could be present the whole world through the Holy Spirit. Charles, Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, it is a better thing for us in this world to have the Holy Spirit in us than to have the bodily presence of Christ with us. We are better helped by the Holy Spirit than we would have been if Jesus had remained on earth. So what does the Spirit do to the blinded eye, to the hardened heart? He convicts us of sin, he convicts us of righteousness, and he convicts us of judgment. So look at verse 7. But I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So here's the truth on this. It is important to note that the Spirit comes to the church, not the world. Now, this is a very important point. When Jesus says, I'm going to send a helper, 
He's not sending a helper to the world. The Holy Spirit is not out helping humanity. The Holy Spirit was given to the church, those who call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit does not minister in a vacuum. Just as the Son of God had to have a body in order to do his work, so the Spirit of God needs a body to accomplish his ministries, and the body is the church. Our bodies are his tool and temples, and he wants to use us to glorify Christ and to witness to a lost world. Now, sometimes we hear people say, pray this, Lord, send your spirit to speak to the lost. May the spirit go from heart to heart. But such praying is no doubt sincere, but it's not biblical. The spirit does not float around in some ghostly way up and down the rows of a church building seeking to win the lost. The Holy Spirit works through the people in whom he lives. For my note takers, I'm going to say this again because I want you to write this down. The Holy Spirit works through the people in whom he lives. Which means without you and me, the Holy Spirit can do nothing. The Holy Spirit needs you and me to do his work through. Again, that, that whole imagery of the Holy Spirit going up and down, right? So the Holy Spirit flies into your church and, you know, goes around and goes, okay, that person's not saved. I'm going to go minister to that person. And, and that person's going to get saved because the Holy Spirit ministered to them. Or I'm going to fly over here. I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to solve their needs. And I'm going to cure their heart. And I'm going to make them feel better. That's not, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. Holy Spirit's not some ghost floating around, looking to do things. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit lives within believers, those who've accepted Christ and made him Lord and Savior. That's where the Holy Spirit dwells. Now, the Holy Spirit does his ministering work through us, you and me. So if the Holy Spirit would like your friend or family to be saved, he is most likely going to use you or somebody else to witness to friend or family member so that they will get saved. The Holy Spirit is powerless without Christians being willing to be used. Now, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, this is Acts chapter 2, he empowered Peter to preach, and the preaching of the word brought conviction to those who heard. Peter the denier. Peter, the one who was like, oh Lord, I'll never leave you. All and, and literally the next scene, we see him denying Christ. We're going to see that coming up here in chapter 18. And Peter's like, oh, I don't know him. I never knew the man. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes through the day of Pentecost. He's using Peter in a very powerful way. Peter's witnessing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to 3,000 people, and they're all getting saved. Peter could have never done that before he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And see, this is, this is a really important point. Because there are a lot of you who think that you can't be used in this way, or you can't do that because you don't possess the ability, the, 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 the desire, the, the talent, right? Right? Well, you're the very person that the Holy Spirit wants to use. The Holy Spirit's not going to use somebody who everybody thinks is a great speaker because then all the praise, honor, and glory will go to that speaker. Oh, he's such a great speaker. No, Peter was not a great speaker. And so the Holy Spirit empowers Peter to be a great speaker, but everybody looks at this and goes, who's that guy? God's using that guy? Really? He's terrible. But yet every time he gets on stage and speaks, it's like, wow, that's amazing. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is it that you believe God has called you to do that you've maybe been hesitant or reluctant to do because you don't feel like you're good at it or you don't feel like that's, that's not your gifting? Hey, if the Holy Spirit is calling you to it, if God's saying, hey, I need you to go do this thing, Go do the thing. 
the Holy Spirit will empower you with everything else that you need. I love this quote. It says, there can be no conversion without conviction, and there can be no conviction apart from the Spirit of God using the Word of God and the witness of the child of God. So we all need to understand that witnessing is a privilege. Witnessing is a privilege. And when was the last time you heard that? Oh, witnessing seems like work. You know, I, I see these guys on YouTube. I, I watch Ray Comfort's videos when he was cruising up and down Huntington Beach on his bike with his dog with sunglasses on. And he's sharing the gospel with all these surfers. Man, that looks like work. Wrong attitude. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be viewed as a privilege because that's what it is. When you're sharing Christ with other people, God is using you. He's empowering you. That's a privilege. But it's also a serious responsibility. It is a matter of life and death. How we need to depend on the Holy Spirit to guide us to the right persons, to give us the right words and enable us patiently to glorify Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will confront the world from within believers and through believers. Those who are of the world do not have the Holy Spirit active within them. We were in our small groups on Wednesday night, and a woman in our small group was sharing a story where... Um, her husband was supposed to get pull-ups and he didn't. And so she was angry. So she said, I'll go to the store and I'll get the pull-ups. And while she's pulling into the parking lot, some lady with a baby is hysterical. She's been hit by a car um, and she's just hysterical like crazy. And, and the woman in our church is saying, you know, this whole situation makes me uncomfortable I don't get out of my car. I don't talk to strangers. She says, but I just felt this prompting that I needed to go give her a hug and that I needed to pray with her. And she said, and so that's what I did. I got out of the car and I went over and I prayed with her. She says, and it was so outside of my character. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Prompts you to do things that outside of his power would make you uncomfortable, but within his power, you do it with ease. That's the beautiful part. My daughter, Andrea, was in an accident. Uh, she was, uh, there was a car in front of her that was turning, and so she slowed down for this car to turn. And while she was waiting for the car to turn, uh, another car behind her got hit. So it was rear-ended and then the car that got rear-ended pushed into andrea who then pushed into the car in front of her so you've got three vehicles now that have been damaged through this and right there in the middle of it andrea got all of the drivers together you know the 17 year old girl gets all these drivers together and she says hey is it okay with all of you if i just pray over the situation right now and so all these drivers who've been in an accident, Dre is praying with them on the side of the road, cars whizzing by, praying that God would bring peace and understanding. And, and one of the women who was one of the drivers, she was a 76-year-old woman. She said, she said, in 76 years, I've never seen anything like this. I've never in an accident. I don't know if she gets in a lot of accidents. She says, I've never been in a situation like this where somebody offered to pray with everybody. She said, it, it was awesome. And so I asked Drea, I said, what prompted you to do that? She says, I don't know. She said, but every time I'm in those situations, she says, my whole body gets hot. And if I don't pray, it won't cool down. And I said, well, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. So she's like, I need to pray. I need to pray. I need to pray. So she prays and then ah, peace. That's the power of the Holy Spirit prompting you to do things that are outside of your normal character, prompting you to say things that you would not normally say. Pretty powerful. The one and only sin the Holy Spirit will convict of. So let's look at verse 9. Actually, verse 8 says, When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. Now, the one and only sin that the Holy Spirit will convict an unbeliever of 
is the sin of not believing in Jesus. That's it. The Holy Spirit does not convict people of smoking. He doesn't speak to them about their swearing, their drinking, or their partying, only their unbelief in Jesus. And this is what makes being a believer, a minister, so incredible. We get to share with people the good news that no matter what they've done or what they've been or where they've been, if they believe in Jesus, they are forgiven of all sin. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 says, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So here's the question. Doesn't the Holy Spirit convict us of sin once we're Christians? Yes, he does. But the conviction of the Spirit does not drive us away from God. On the contrary, it draws us to God. It's the condemnation of Satan that makes us ashamed to talk to the Father. You can always tell the difference between the Spirit convicting you and Satan condemning you, because if it's Satan condemning you won't want to pray, and you won't want to spend time in the Word. You'll just hang out in a hole and hide your head. But if it's the Spirit convicting, then you'll hear. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says this, Come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you'll be drawn back to Jesus. Now, I remember back in my late teens, early 20s, when I was living a very sinful, prideful life, and you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you know that you shouldn't do that. Come back to the Father. Get back in the Word. Get back into church. Get back in the good graces of your family. That's the Holy Spirit convicting us. But see, I wanted to block that out because I wasn't ready to go back to that. I wanted to continue my life of sin. And so in in I, I've got two voices here, right? You've seen the little devil on both sides. So I have the Holy Spirit on one side saying, hey, you know this is, isn't right. Stop living this sinful life and turn your life back to Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. On the other side, we have Satan who's saying, oh, you can't go back now. <laughs> look at all you've done. Look at your, look at your trail of sin. Nobody's going to forgive you of that. You need to just forget it. You need to leave. You need to go away from your family this is who you are. This is what you've done. So you got no choice. You need to go be that now. So the Holy Spirit convicts. Satan condemns. Satan is the one who tells you you can never get clean again. Satan is the one who tells you you can never stop watching pornography again. Satan's the one that tells you eh, you're a drunk. You might as well just keep drinking. You're a drug addict. You might as well just keep taking drugs. You know, acknowledge who and what you are and just be that. That is Satan convicting, bringing us back to the cross, condemnation, driving us away from the cross. So if you are a Christian, if you have Jesus Christ living inside of you, and you have not been walking with him, and you have been saying to yourself, well, you know, I guess this is just who I am. That's Satan. That's condemnation. That is not what God has called for you. That is not God's desire for you. It is God's desire that you leave those sinful ways so that the Holy Spirit can use you in a mighty and a powerful way for Jesus Christ, for sharing the gospel. God wants to use you. Well, he can't possibly use me. I'm not good at this or that or this or that. Perfect. God is not looking for perfect people. He's not looking for talented people. He's looking for willing people. Remember, the Holy Spirit can do nothing outside of a person. The Holy Spirit needs you to share the gospel because you have access to groups that others of us can't get into. You have the ability to get into areas that the rest of us can't get into. Your sphere of influence, your circle of friends, these are people that we can't get to. God wants to use you. But he's not going to be able to use you if you continue to feed the lies of Satan who's condemning you and saying that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you can never be anything than what you are. That's all Satan. 
God is telling you, you are good enough. You are smart enough. You are capable enough. And I can do incredible things through you if you will simply surrender your life to me and say, Lord, I'm willing. Lord, wherever you tell me to go, I say yes. Lord, whatever you call me to do, I say yes. Whoever you want me to talk to or go to, I say yes. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will do incredible things in those areas. Not because you are able or because you are talented or because you are you are you are the perfect person, but rather because you are a willing vessel to be used. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be used. So here in verse 9, according to Jesus, not believing in him is the sin. The Holy Spirit only convicts the non-believer of one thing, and that is denying Christ. That's it. Ray Comfort said this, Why will sinners go to hell? Much damage has been done to the cause of the gospel by telling the world that they will go to hell because they don't believe in Jesus. This makes no sense to the ungodly. It seems unreasonable that God would eternally damn them for not believing something. However, the verse can be explained this way. If a man jumps out of a plane without a parachute, he will perish because he transgressed the law of gravity. Had he put on a parachute, he would have been saved. Now, in one sense, he perished because he didn't put on the parachute. But the primary reason he died was because he broke the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. If a sinner refuses to trust in Jesus Christ before he passes through the door of death, he will perish. This isn't because he refused to trust the Savior, but rather because he transgressed the law of God. Had he put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the parachute, Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, rather, close yourselves, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. If the unbeliever would have put on Jesus Christ, he would have been saved. But because he refused to repent, he will suffer the full consequences of his sin. Sin is not failing to believe in Jesus. Sin is transgression of the law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So the point that he's making here is, Gravity is something everybody agrees with, right? Everybody's thrown a rock and it went up in the air and it came back down. Everybody has fallen off something and hurt themselves. The law of gravity is the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. The law of the universe is if you are a sinner in need of a savior and you don't accept Jesus Christ before you die, you go to hell. That's the law of the world. That's the law of God. That's the law of gravity. You can't argue it. It just is what it is. Now, you can avoid getting hurt. Again, the parachute analogy. You know that what goes up must come down. But if you put on a parachute, you can jump out of an airplane and live. Same is true. You live in a sinful fallen world. But if you put on the parachute of Jesus Christ, you can live for eternity. Again, these are indisputable laws. The only difference is everyone believes in the law of gravity, and not everyone believes that there is a place called hell. Now, do they really not believe it, or do they just not want to acknowledge it? I believe that they believe it. But to acknowledge it, to say, okay, yeah, I believe that there's a God. I believe that there's a heaven and a hell. But I don't want I don't want to follow God. I don't want to surrender my life to God. I, I like me. I want to be me. I don't want to submit or surrender. I don't want to be under anybody's control. <laughs> you already are. You're either, either the, the, under the control of the creator of the universe, God, or you are under the control of the prince of the world, Satan. Either way, you're under somebody's control. Verse 10, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. 
The Spirit also convicts of righteousness by pointing to the only righteous one. Again, verse 10 says, in regards of righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Oh, no, you know what? I'm okay, you say. I'm okay. I'm righteous. <laughs> so you don't understand. I, I volunteer at the Rotary Club. I'm, I'm, I volunteer for the American Cancer Society. I'm righteous. Oh, righteous enough that death can't hold you? So righteous that when you die, will you rise again? Did Gandhi? Nope. Did Muhammad? Nope. Did Confucius? Nope. Did Buddha? Unlike any other figure in history, Jesus Christ alone rose from the dead and ascended to the Father. Thus, he is the only righteous one to whom the Spirit points, of whom the Spirit convicts. Again, this goes back to this whole understanding that you cannot earn your way to heaven. You can never do enough. You can never be enough. You can never be righteous or holy enough. The Bible says that your righteousness is like filthy rags. When you list off your resume of reasons why you are righteous, it's a joke. God doesn't care about all the great and amazing things you've done trying to be a good person. You either accept him as Lord and Savior or you don't. Now, when you accept him as Lord and Savior, you're still going to do all of those great and amazing things, but you're going to stop doing them because you feel obligated to do them. Oh, I have to do that. And now you're going to start doing it because you want to do them. Because we're a child of the king. We want to serve him. We want to serve others because he loves them. And we just, from our heart, our outpouring heart of, of desire, we're just overflowing with love because God lives inside of us that so we can't help but share the good news with other people. Again, witnessing should not be hard work. Witnessing should not be obligatory. Witnessing should not feel painful. Witnessing is a privilege. The fact that you're being used by Jesus, the fact that the Holy Spirit is equipping you and instructing you and guiding you and leading you, what a privilege. Why do we make it so hard? Three important tasks of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 10 and 11. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. Three important tasks of the Holy Spirit are, number one, convicting the world of its sin and calling it to repentance. Number two, revealing the standard of God's righteousness to anyone who believes because Christ would no longer be physically present on earth. And number three, demonstrating Christ's judgment over sin. These are... These are the activities of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned, when Jesus died on the cross, the ruler of this world was judged and his power permanently broken. It's not we who were judged. No, the one who held you in his grasp, the one who made you miserable, the one who caused you problems has been judged. That's the good news. Satan has been judged. Sin has been judged. When Jesus died on the cross, sin no longer had dominion or power or authority over anybody. You can stop sinning right now in Jesus' name. But before Jesus died on the cross, that was not a true statement. We didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we do. And you can cry out to God and say, God, I'm a sinner I know that I've been sinning. I know that I've been living a life that I shouldn't be living. But Lord, I, I can't stop. And I ask that you would come into my heart. I ask that you would make, that you would be my Lord and Savior. I ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would give me the ability to stop. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to believers. One of many distinctions between the world and the world and his own is the manner in which the Holy Spirit ministers. His ministry to the world convicts in order to bring repentance. His ministry to believers, by contrast, is to bring obedience through transformation. 
The Spirit accomplishes his missions of belief, his mission of believer transformation by bringing divine truth to the minds of his own. Before scripture was written, he revealed truth to the minds of his own. Before scripture was written, he revealed truth directly to certain people. Prophets in the Old Testament, prophets and apostles in the New Testament era. Once the last apostle, John, completed the final written communication from God, the book of Revelation, humanity had received all the divine truth needed to live obediently. Now his ministry is to call scripture to mind, illuminate its meaning, couple it with experience, and apply it. We participate in the Holy Spirit's transformational process through the exercise of spiritual disciplines. Here's the truth on this. Any Christian who surrenders to Christ can be taught by the Spirit. Okay. Now, this is for all of you who are like, I don't understand. When I read the Bible, I don't understand what I'm reading. I don't, I don't get it. I don't recall things things very quickly how could i ever be used of god to witness i have a terrible memory i can't recall memory verses well turn your bibles to psalm chapter 119 so hang a left in your bible and i want you to underline these verses in your bible psalm chapter 119 beginning in verse 97 and we're going to read through verse 104. Here's what it says. Oh, how I love your oh how I love your law. I meditate on it all day. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I may so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Now, what is this passage telling us? It's telling us that when you simply commit yourself to studying the word. Now, you can listen to a million sermons online. You can attend a million different churches. You know, I can tell you that Jacqueline and I on any given Sunday, we're at this church at nine, we're at this church at 11, we're listening to this pastor's sermon, we're listening to this pastor's sermon, you guys are here listening to me, right? We can, we can listen to a lot of things. But what we are exhorted to do is to open up the word and study it for ourselves, and as a result of doing that, we will be wiser than our enemies. We will be smarter than our teachers. We will be more understanding than the elders. That's a pretty powerful statement. Just by studying the word, we'll be smarter and more knowledgeable than all of these other people. That's pretty impressive. But we've got to be in the word. If we're not in the word, we are going to be weak. Verse 12. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And he will bring glory to me by taking from, taking from what is mine and making it known to you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will understand Scripture. We will understand truth. We will have a better grip on what's happening on the world stages because we apply everything and we look at it through the lens of Scripture, right? This, this coming election. All right, everybody's freaking out about it. Well, what does the Bible say about that? We covered that last Sunday. You can go back and listen to last Sunday's sermon. We talked about how do we see these big worldly events through a lens of the Bible? What, is, what does the Lord say about these things? Verse 14, he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Jesus is not worried 
and neither should you be about your son, your daughter, your wife, your brother, your neighbor, or your friend. But they're not seeing it, you protest. I'm talking to them. I'm I'm sending books. I'm inviting them to church. I'm, I'm doing everything I can. I'm lining up counseling for them, and they're still not getting it. And Jesus said, I know you can't understand what I'm saying, but I also know that when the Spirit comes, he will guide you in all truth. Now, truly, it's not by excellent argumentation or through a powerful presentation that the light goes on and the heart opens up. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit that people who are blind begin to see. Jesus knew this. That's why he didn't worry, and neither should you. Now, I take great comfort in this. Verse 15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I sent the Spirit who will take from what is mine and make it known to you. The most powerful thing you can be doing for friends and family and neighbors that don't know Christ is to be in prayer for them. You know, I, I think it was Wednesday night, I was talking to a woman whose children are not walking with the Lord, and this, this pains her, as it should. You know, thankfully, right now, all of my kids are walking with the Lord. But to think of a time when they aren't you know, I, I think back to my own parents, that season when I was clearly not walking with the Lord, how painful that must have been. And in the midst of it, the worst thing they could have done would have been to send me a letter condemning my actions or, or to, you know, sit me down and say, Lee, God hates what you're doing. They didn't do any of that. They didn't even communicate with me other than to say, I love you, God loves you, and I'm praying for you. Boy, is there anything more hurtful to a Christian who's living a life of sin than to have somebody else say, I'm praying for you? You don't need, I don't need your prayers. Don't pray for me. You can stuff, stuff your prayers in a sack. I don't want your prayers. That's the response of a Christian who is backslidden, who's living in sin and knows it. Don't you dare pray for me. <laughs> Most powerful thing we can do is to pray. That's the most powerful thing we can do. Verse 16, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Jesus was referring to his death now only a few hours away, and his resurrection that would occur three days later. I want to give you this in closing. This is a statement from Billy Graham. He said this, the Holy Spirit convicts us. He shows us the Ten Commandments. The law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. And we look in the mirror of the Ten Commandments. We see ourselves in that mirror. We do not study the Word of God in order to argue religion with people or to show off our grasp of spiritual things. That is not why we study the Word. We study the Word to see Jesus Christ, to know God better, to glorify Him in our lives. And as we witness in this hostile world, the Spirit uses the word he taught us, and we share Jesus Christ with the lost. It is our job to witness. It is the Spirit's job to convict. I want to say that again. It is our job to witness. It is the Spirit's job to convict. So when you sit down, in, if you do your devotions in the morning, if you do your devotions at night, if you're sitting down with Bible opened, looking for ways that you can combat against attacks from the enemy. Okay, that's a great verse. I'm going to use that the next time so-and-so says this. I'm going to say that. You're studying the Bible for the wrong reasons. We study the Bible so that we can better understand the heart of Jesus. So that we can better understand his compassion and his grace and his mercy. That's why we study the Bible, so that we can better understand our creator. Because when we go out to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we go out to witness to other people, we are simply one creation sharing with another creation who the creator is. And so our goal, our desire should simply be to better understand the creator and the love that he has for other people. And so when we witness, it should be from a platform of love and grace and mercy. 
because the person we're witnessing to, if they don't know Jesus Christ, one, they are missing out on this incredible experience, this incredible life of walking with Jesus. But if we're witnessing to somebody who doesn't know him as Lord and Savior, we're also witnessing to somebody who is going to spend an eternity in hell. God doesn't want that. The Bible says that he wishes that none should perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of himself. It is not God's desire for people to go to hell. Well, then why did he create such a place? Because God gave us free will, and we have the freedom to choose. Do I want to spend an eternity with God? That's heaven. But if I want to live my life on planet Earth with nothing to do with God, why would I want to spend an eternity with him? And so God says, okay, if you don't want to spend an eternity with me in the Father's house, in the mansion that I'm creating for you, if that's not where you want to spend your eternity, then I'll create a place where I am not. And that is hell. And that's the reality of the situation. Every person that you encounter either knows Jesus and is going to heaven or rejects Jesus, denies God, and is going to hell. It is not your job to convince, to persuade. It is simply your job to share. It is our job to witness. And one thing we've learned as it relates to sharing the gospel and witnessing especially in this woke culture that we are in. Again, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It is our job to witness. So asking somebody, would it be okay if I shared with you what God has done in my life, how he's changed me and transformed me? Can I share that with you? See, in sharing your witness, in sharing your testimony, you can't refute that. Somebody can't say, you're wrong, that didn't happen, the Bible doesn't say that. It's your story. I, I'm simply sharing with you what God's done for me in my life. It's all. Again, our job is to witness. Well, witness what? Witness what Jesus has done through our lives and in our lives and where we would be without him. Nobody can refute that. Nobody can argue that. So here's the application. The Holy Spirit will open up our hearts and minds to understand the ways and the truth of God. He will make it clear to us what Jesus has said in the written word, and he will give us the wisdom we need to apply that word on a daily basis and to live in responsive obedience to our Lord. He doesn't need you to have a degree in divinity. He doesn't need you to have a doctorate in, in theology. He simply needs you to understand his word, which he will give you understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you this, when you open up this book to study it, before you do, be, Lord, speak to me through your word this morning. Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, give me understanding. Help me to see, help me to know what it is you're telling me through your word. Now open word and read and watch how the pages unfold and everything becomes three-dimensional. Suddenly you can see where you couldn't see before. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So boldness should not be something we have to think about. Boldness is simply the result of being in this book and being unwilling or being unable to contain our excitement and our enthusiasm. Boldness should come as a result of just spending time in the Word and spending time in the Lord's presence. Be bold for Jesus should not be an action. It should be an attitude. It's just who you are. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your Word this morning. Lord, thank you for this reminder that you have not called us to be experts or to be professionals or to be well-polished or well-seasoned, Lord. You have simply called us to be in your word. You have simply called us to have a desire to understand you more and to know you more and to fellowship with you more so that we can't open our mouths without sharing a story about what you've done or sharing a, a truth about what you've revealed to us. And Lord, it is my prayer that 
you would help each and every one of us to absorb your word, Lord, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would have the ability to recall scriptures, to recall truths, and to share with other people with great enthusiasm what you've done and what you're doing in our lives and through us. And Lord, I pray that we would all have a desire to be used by you. What a great privilege to be used by you. So Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, and just give us the desire and the, the willingness to go where you would call us, to share with those you put in front of us. And Lord, that everywhere we are, we would recognize that you have divinely appointed us in that moment to be a witness and to be a testimony in that room, to that person, to that group, and that we would never back down. Lord, I pray that you would use us in this way. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the ministering wisdom that we receive. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Hey, I want to remind everybody, um, we have a prayer hotline. If you need prayer at any time for anything, call us, 800-461-0216. 800-461-0216. Uh, would love to have you. Um, if there's anything we can be in prayer with you about, for you about, please let us know. And also a reminder, next Sunday, we will not be live here at 645 a.m. We will be going live at 830 a.m. That's Pacific time. So next Sunday, 830, uh, we will be going live through He's the Solution. Uh, so you'll come to the same place you've always come to, but we will be live at the Be Bold for Jesus conference, and you guys will be joining me for our sermon there. So we will, we will be taking communion next Sunday. So if you would like to participate with us in communion, please make sure you have a cracker or something and some grape juice or some wine. Whatever you want to do is fine. And then you can participate in communion with us wherever you are. Uh, so just be aware, uh, next Sunday, 8.30, and that'll go till 10. Um, and then uh, remember, we have Candace Cameron Bure, uh, DJ Tanner from Full House, if you remember the show years and years ago. Uh, she is our keynote speaker. She'll be speaking next Sunday. But you can join us for all of the speakers, all of the artists, uh, even... Um, Dr. Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages, next Friday, this coming Friday night at 7 p.m. Pacific. And you can get all of that for 49 bucks through our live stream ticket. So go to bb4j.com, bb4j.com, and simply click on the live stream ticket. And it's 49 bucks for the all three days, both the youth stage and the main stage. But would love to have you join us there for that. And please, 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 please be in prayer about this event, uh, all of the logistics, all of the travel, the speakers, uh, but more than anything, the hearts of those in attendance. My desire is that Christians would leave encouraged and inspired to go out and be bold for Jesus in their walk and their faith, and that those coming who do not know Christ, that they would accept him as Lord and Savior as a result of this conference. So if you can specifically be in prayer for those two things, it would be greatly appreciated. So we will see you all there next Sunday, Lord willing. But until then, God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your week. See you next week. Goodbye, everybody.